And we're getting into a topic that I am really passionate about as an online educator, and that is learner interaction. And it can definitely be challenging in a face-to-face -face classroom even, but online it can have a little bit of extra layers of challenge um, whenever you're trying to get students to, to join in and collaborate with each other. So we'll start with the first question, and that is what makes the Russian language challenging to use? when fostering learner to learner interaction. And Olga, if you'd like to start, that would be fantastic. So I think that first of all, what makes it a little bit more difficult in general to teach, and especially when you try to create activities where students have to talk to, to one another, it's the fact that Russian belongs to the group number three of difficulty right in terms of difficult languages so it means that it takes much longer time for students to to get to the level of the proficiency where they comfortably uh, can express their ideas and what i've noticed is that uh, that's one of the challenges because students want to participate in some activities they want to express their ideas they want to participate in a dialogue but they find themselves not being able to do this, especially at the level of beginning, like in, in novice students and maybe low intermediate, where they start running off vocabulary or their grammar becomes uh, takes such a deep then they cannot understand each other. So I think that's like explaining that uh, to them that no, if you ever had experience with Spanish, let's say, or maybe a German or French uh, languages, uh, you should not expect it to be progressing as fast as maybe in these languages. So, and that's what also makes it a little bit more challenging. And I think that um, sometimes even pronunciations and uh, pronunciations, intonations, stress marks because uh, Russian can be challenging. You uh, change the stress mark. You put the stress mark in the incorrect syllable. Uh, it can, can completely create a different meaning <laughs> of the same word, right? So sometimes this is a challenge and we need to emphasize the correct pronunciation, the correct <laughs> stress, right? Stress marks uh, on our syllable. And just encouraging students uh, to use uh, spontaneous speech. So I think because they realize that Russian is a little bit, especially English, uh, native English speakers, Russian is uh, so different, especially grammar with case system, conjugations. So uh, they, uh, very often my students are hesitant to even like try to, to, to speak because they're afraid of making mistakes and they, they want to be perfect. <laughs> they want to, to make no mistakes. And because of this, they're, hesitant to to interact to participate in dialogue so so there are a lot of things that uh makes it a little bit more challenging <laughs> to create uh, successful activities where they have to talk to one another or to even talk in a small group because they might feel uncomfortable uh with uh, because of their level of proficiency i agree it's really important to set the expectation that a level three language is going to be more challenging for, say, a native English speaker who might have taken Spanish in the past and was able to use the language quickly. So I definitely think there's a lot of value in that. And it's challenging to lower that effective filter, but I think we try our best. Uh, Larissa, if I could please ask you the same question, what do you think makes the Russian language challenging to use when you're fostering learner to learner interaction? Yes, I uh, agree with Olga. Uh, of course, uh, it's not very close languages, uh, English and Russian, and especially uh, the major things like uh, in English, we you look at the sentence as subject, verb, and object structure. Um, so it's critical for meaning to uh, have this word order correct. On the contrast, in the Russian language relies heavily on the endings of the words. Uh, such as noun cases, verb conjugations, to convey this meaning. And English speakers often struggle with this when learning Russian, because they not only make mistakes, they even only hear kind of the subject word, verb object. So this is how they get used to understand. Uh, so it's it's hard to uh, re rewrite their um, understanding and kind of uh, the uh, brain too. So um, they focus on word order. 
and overlook the importance of the endings, um, both in speaking and listening. Uh, the example that I'd like to uh, show students is the uh, yeah, the simple sentence about kalapkas yela lisa. So uh, the English speaker might mistaken, mistakenly uh, thinking uh, that uh, kalapka is actually the feminine subject performing an action rather than the object. Uh, so even if students have learned the grammar rules without this vocabulary, solid vocabulary of the, to know the base words, like to know what kalabok is, um, it's the meaning uh, lost. So they misinterpret the sentence. So here's like the arrow um, in a communication you can see here could be of misunderstanding. Um, and pronunciation, of course, like Olga mentioned, uh, pronunciation too, uh, you have to pronounce endings very clearly uh, and pronounce the stress in, in the consonants. So pronunciation could be crucial, right? When there is like uh, kalapka, uh, in other word, karopka, right? It's like very, very, there's a different stress pattern and then in one, uh, one consonant and then completely different meaning. So um, you can actually see this misunderstanding visually when I um, ask students after I, I read this sentence to, to show the picture what the meaning of the sentence is. And sometimes they do uh, show this, like the, the box is eating the fox instead of the, <laughs> the meaning is that, yes, uh, Kalabok is the gingerbread man. Um, so, and it's kind of, we uh, look at this and laugh at this, but also kind of it makes the point of uh, really paying attention, really paying attention and teaching vocabulary, right? Before, uh, before students can, can speak freely. Um, I also noticed um, another, the difference between heritage and non-heritage uh, speakers when they involved in the communication uh, in with each other. Um, I noticed that actually the non-heritage speakers, um, when they make mistake, they're not so uh, stressed about this. So most of them, yes, they don't want to, to especially teenagers, for example, but they're very proud to be like, you know, novice meet and they, have, they can make phrases and there's very like they celebrate it. Um, on the opposite, the heritage speakers, they kind of feel the shame of uh, making the mistakes. And very often, like, uh, you know, uh, in the communities, in the families, even though, of course, everybody wants to, you know, uh, teach and correct mistakes all the time, kind of over corrections all the time, and not listening to the message, and then kind of even a shaming, like, oh, you cannot speak Russian. And, um, not every, again, it's not in every family, of course, no, but I've seen this a lot of students not speaking because they're afraid of making mistakes in their language, even though the level of a language is much higher than the uh, non-heritage speakers, but they just kind of feel this pressure of this heritage language, the family language, everybody made uh, mistakes and laughing and how you pronounce it in, incorrectly. So it takes time to start thinking about the language um, as a language learning, right? So this is another skills that they should have. Uh, so go away from this shaming uh, culture. Uh, but heritage speakers will understand uh, the sentence, Kalapkas Yela Lisa, um, because they know, you know, this is one of the stories uh, that they heard um, growing up. So one of the first stories, probably their grandmother or mother read to them, uh, but not necessarily they would uh, explain why that's the meaning. They just know like, yeah, because they know the content and vocabulary words involved with this story. So uh, kind of to wrap it up, um, I would say there are two uh, things here that a complexity of Russian grammar, of course, and like limited active vocabulary that students have. Uh, then the pronunciation challenges, the influence of English, uh, and of course, this, this psychological fear of making mistakes in their own uh, like home language, all of these things contribute to the difficulties in, in this learner-to-learner -learner interaction in Russian language. 
you made a really good point about heritage speakers feeling extra self-conscious, not wanting to make a mistake. And it is really important that we do all we can to try to lower that effective filter. But that's a really good point and something to think about, especially if we work with heritage and non-heritage, that some of them might be very afraid of making mistakes. So we want to try to be as open and welcoming as possible. Thank you so much. Uh, Evgeny, again, same question. What makes the Russian language challenging to use when you're fostering learner-to-learner -learner interaction, especially in the online space? Sure. Um, I, I like that Larissa brought up that um, this notion that we need to react to message for the meaning first and then to form second. I think we'll have time to talk about this later, giving feedback and what we actually react to. But I really want to emphasize that um, um, correcting students should should not come at the price of like them feeling discomfortable uh discomfort and uncomfortable um and uh, something that we talked about in the first session the alphabet the difference between the non non latin alphabet certainly slows down uh or makes it harder uh for them to read and also to uh to write uh so if they were studying spanish or you know, Italian, they could start, you know, they familiarity with letters uh, wouldn't be a problem. So they could start typing and interacting with, with each other via chat or um, text messages right away. So that um, that certainly is an issue. I, I wonder how, how much of a help, um, like, cell phone keyboard is is if if that's kind of a helping students because it's relatively easy to set it up so typing on the phone might be actually easy and i know some students actually sometimes type their homework on on the phone because they don't need to have stickers and you know a different layout of a keyboard so that could actually be an interesting solution um, that they will um, they can use to to speed up the uh, writing practice, but I would say the alphabet, uh, different alphabet, is certainly one big uh, issue, especially for obviously for novice learners. The difference in alphabet would definitely be a challenge, especially for those who are coming in with no Russian background and they're having to get used to something brand new. So that could definitely be a huge challenge as well. Thank you for that. And uh, Heather, same question. What do you think makes the Russian language challenging to use, especially whenever you're fostering online learner-to-learner -learner interaction? Um, yeah, this is a really good question. Uh, and I kind of have two, I guess, parts to the answer. And the first is, is not really specific to Russian, I don't think. Um, and that's just, especially online learning, um, it really depends on the mode of learning, whether or not it's asynchronous or synchronous. Um, I say that because with our own online class, we're mostly asynchronous. We do have one synchronous meeting a week, um, but interaction is necessary, right? Even from like the very beginning. And so how to foster that, how to like get that to happen when students are running up against these incredible challenges that my colleagues just mentioned um, about learning Russian, overcoming uh, difficulties like with learning new alphabet and you know a new sound system, new grammar, all of that um, is just being online. And so for asynchronous, you know it's a, a lot has to do with you know difference in um, scheduling, uh, making sure that students can like find uh, the time and the like the ability and thank goodness like we all have Zoom now like students can meet up on Zoom very easily uh, and carry out different tasks that I might give them um, in the synchronous environment. Uh, it's it can be really challenging because you know you see everybody on the screen you're seeing everybody's faces and to get students to start interacting with each other when they're having to like overcome all of these challenges that like my colleagues were mentioning um, can be really difficult so 
I try to like having been through this myself, you know, my, my colleagues here are um, native speakers and they are super sympathetic uh, instructors. And I can tell you all that I was one of those students who never wanted to make a mistake. I was so intimidated by Russian, um, but I also fell in love with it. I love the way it sounded. I, I thought it was this, you know, great um, kind of puzzle uh, to, to work through. Um, and so knowing how I started, I really try to um, take that approach with my students and to, and to be encouraging and sympathetic and, um, you know, go in and, and tell them that, yes, it is, you know, it is a, a, a tier three language. It is more difficult. It's, you know, it, it looks so new, so strange, so, so foreign, right? How are we going to deal with this? Um, but I, I dive in, right, on the first day. They can't read how to say hello, but they all learn within the first 15 minutes. You know, we sound it out, everybody repeats it, and everybody introduces themselves to everybody else in the room within the first uh, 10 minutes. This is in person and online. Um, and so we break the ice immediately. And, um, you know, I, I try to share my own stories about how uh, that was the first word I heard in Russian. I thought I'm never going to be able to reproduce that. And I tell them, yes, you are actually going to be able to do it. And you're going to do it right now. Um, and so online, um, what's actually great about online is that um, after the synchronous meeting, after we've practiced saying hello and, and nice to meet you and, and they feel pretty good about it, the very first homework assignment is to actually post, like I, I said, uh, our last meeting that we use Canvas um, for our online courses. I actually have everyone for their first assignment post a discussion recording of themselves, introducing themselves again, just like they did in our synchronous meeting, saying, hello, my name is, and nice to meet you. So what's nice is that at home, they can practice as much as they want before they upload this video to the discussion board. And then the follow-up to this is that they have to watch at least three videos and post replies to these videos saying, nice to meet you. So I agree with all of my colleagues what they said, that it is incredibly difficult given the alphabet, given the completely like different grammar that, that we're used to um, in English. Uh, it's, it's incredibly intimidating. Um, and so I try to get them started like from day one, um, just break that ice, laugh, and just really encourage them at every turn that it is okay to make mistakes. Yes, it's scary, um, but we're, you know, we're in this together. I love how you talked about breaking the ice because that is just so important to help students feel at ease with each other. And ultimately that helps build community too, which is a huge plus. Thank you for that.